Thanks a lot. Uh, we have with us Mark Ram Prakash, uh, former England batsman, former England batting coach, and of course an ace dancer, uh, winner of reality show in England. Thanks a lot, Mark, for joining me on this chat that we are doing on uh, this YouTube channel. Pleasure. Mark, uh, let me take you back to the late 80s, early 90s. Uh, the turn of the 90s, there are a bunch of young batsmen who came to the scene in England, including you, Graham Hick. Uh, My Michael Atherton, Nasser Hussain, uh, so on and so forth. You were all supposed to chart in a new era in English cricket. Uh, where do you think that particular bunch of batsmen finished in your assessment post their careers? Uh, well, I think uh, I think that uh, the 90s, uh, when I look back on it, several things come to mind. Um, one, I was very proud to play in that era because I think that there was, Test cricket was still the pinnacle for every single player growing up wanting to play the game. And I think it was an era that produced wonderful world-class players. Um, of course, you had the traditional powerhouse teams, but Sri Lanka really came to the fore with some fantastic individual players um, and, of course, their World Cup win. Um, and so, uh, you know, every team that I played against, I, I felt, uh, you know, there, there were world-class players that you had to, uh, to, play at, to go up against. Um, in terms of the young batters, so that was challenging, of course. You know, so if I go into the night, my 91 was my, my debut series and uh, the West Indies were still, you know, still a formidable team. And, and they toured the UK and, and Ambrose and Walsh probably led the attack with Marshall and, and Patrick Patterson. And then in 92... Uh, Pakistan toured and the emergence of Wakar and Wazim, who bowled brilliantly well, you know, backed up by Mushtaq Ahmed and Akib Javid. And then, um, you know, we played uh, Australia, of course, and and um, and South Africa's re-emergence as well. So I think that, that there were real challenges. And I think that um, uh, English cricket had its, had its issues around management of players um, and creating a team ethos. Um, because we had seen uh, in the late 80s, particularly uh, a, a revolving door uh, in terms of um, the England team. I think they used 30 something players in the series against Australia in 89. Uh, and, and the year before that, in 88, you know, we lost 4 0 against West Indies and we had four different captains, mm. um, which is unheard of and really showed a lack of management. Uh, of the team uh, and a, a coherent strategy for England as a cricket team. So um, coming into the 90s, um, I, I think that uh, for young batsmen, um, we were challenged not only by the standard of the opposition, but also the environment we had to work within. Being in and out of the side and then finally getting your first test under in 98, how big a moment was that, that two against West Indies at Bridgestone Barbados? Well, wonderful memories for me. And uh, I had um, come into the side in 91. I played all five tests against the West Indies as a 21-year-old. Now, I, I, I don't, I, when I look back upon that, I was very proud of you know, being involved in the series, but I had no real expectation um, to do well. And I was just happy to sort of be playing um, I was in and out of the side because after that, subsequently, I didn't really take the opportunities that were presented and um, had a very up and down ride with England. And, and, and so each time you um, get an opportunity at international cricket and it doesn't go well and then you're left out. The I'm going to say, yeah, I'm going to say pressure or the challenge or when you're recalled becomes a little harder. You hope to go away and work at your game and be more prepared. But um, the, uh, the want to, to succeed the next time can increase to such, an, to such a degree that sometimes it can stifle performance. Um, and so my experiences were that each time I got dropped, left out, that when I'd come back into the side, um, I was aware of how much I needed to try and uh, make an impression and for me um, it kind of stifled my performance I wanted it too much if you like and um, and so that was very difficult to deal with and then I was in and outside um, and I, I got picked for the West Indies tour in 98 um, 
after I think coming in for the last test against Australia in, in, of the summer, and we we toured the Caribbean. Uh, it was a place I was familiar with. I'd had I'd toured there four years previously. Um, I knew what the conditions were like, um, but I didn't play in the first test match in Jamaica, uh, which was abandoned. And uh, I remember walking out in the morning of the game and I saw Rohan Kanhai, uh, who was coaching West Indies at the time. And he said, oh, look, are you playing? I said, no. He said, don't worry. Good one to miss. And sure enough, <laughs> sure enough, um, the, the, the match lasted about an hour, I think. And, uh, and then it was called off. So I didn't start the series, but I came in later and um, probably uh, played in, in my, uh, I, played, I played the match in Guyana, which is where my dad's from, which was a very proud moment. Um, so to play there. And then the following game in Barbados, the pitch was probably the best pitch of the uh, series. And, um, and so happily, I was managed to capitalise on, on playing on a good pitch. And finally, uh, I played in numerous matches against West Indies and, and really struggled. Uh, in particular, I think someone like Courtney Walsh uh, w was very difficult. I found him very difficult, very tall, very accurate. Um, uh, and sort of, uh, you know, he, he uh, I felt was a clever bowler that I found it very difficult to, to sort of negotiate him. So finally in, in Barbados, I managed to get one back on them. Which captain-coach combination in your view managed to do the best in the 90s? None of them. None of them. And, um, I, you know, I, I mean that, I, you know, and it's not, it's not, um, it's just, uh, that's not a direct sort of criticism and I don't have any bitterness towards anybody. What I mean by that is, I, I, so first of all, I always point finger at myself. You know, if I don't do well in anything, I'll always look at myself first. And, and so clearly I would, I would do that. So when I look back at my career in the 90s, I would always point the finger at myself first before looking anywhere else. But if we're going to talk about management and coaching and environment, um, the world's a very different place in 2020 than it was back in the 90s. And so I think people are so much more familiar with trying to create a good environment to try and help people with different personalities settle down uh, into a team, to integrate, to forge a good team togetherness so that everybody can try and perform. And for some people, they need to be on the edge a little bit and um, proving a point. Most people I've found want to be happy and relaxed um, and sort of get on quite well with the people around them. And, and so that way, that in sort of engenders confidence, really. And so I was, I had that at county level in Middlesex and Surrey, first class level, but I never really managed to find it in the England side. Um, I think the captains of England throughout the 90s, Graham Gooch, Alex Stewart, Michael Atherton, you know, they really tried their best and they had a big job. But because we struggled on the field and we lost series um, and um, players were inconsistent, you know, it's very difficult for the captain. I, I, would say, I would lay more at the coach's door, actually, and feel that the coaches in that era, I didn't feel that they were, as I look at coaching now um, in 2020, I didn't feel the coaches were up to speed at all. And I don't feel that anyone really made the effort to get to know me and to sort of ask, OK, what do you want from from the coach, Mark? Um, and how do you try and get out of the individual, you know, to to ask how best they can facilitate, um, you know, what what it is that I would want from that environment um, to help me settle down and, and play well? Of course, ultimately, it's down to the individual, you know, when they walk over the the white line, it's down to them. But um, I think that there is so much you can help players um, when they go into that environment. There's such a lot to think about. There's the white noise of big crowds, the intense media spotlight, and a lot of players put pressure on themselves, uh, which can inhibit performance. And I think Graham Hick and myself were probably guilty of that. Uh you particularly did quite well against the Australians. Did you enjoy the challenge of playing against the Australians in that particular era? Because they had a very good bowling attack, a very good team. Well, I, I think that uh, what happened with the Australians was because they, they always had a lot to say. Um, they all, I mean, they never shy of a word or two. Uh, McGrath, Warren, um, Steve Waugh, constant um, 
it's a constant verbal battle as uh, as well as uh you know you're up against some very good bowlers and i think sometimes i think for me probably that um that helped take my mind off other things that i may have been thinking about and i just got into playing the game um and it probably got my back up a little bit so um you're right i had a a good record against australia and um i enjoyed the battles with them of course uh you know they they had they were a wonderful team during the 90s i mean to bowl them out once was an achievement let alone twice and uh you know shane warn was a, a great competitor you know great theater when he was bowling and um you know uh i think uh, those uh those memories of playing against those guys i i hold very dearly you know that i i enjoyed i enjoyed the battle and the challenge against australia you played last for england in 2002 how difficult was it that particular phase after that because you never got to come back after that yeah well i i i sort of I t- one thing i probably do look back at with regret was um the tour to india in 2001 um we uh there was a lot of talk about whether england would tour or not i was firmly in the camp that england should tour but obviously 2001 that you know was the um Uh, the world trade center uh, the, the attack and uh, there was a lot of discussion about um whether the tour should continue or not i was firmly in the camp that the tour should definitely continue and i was probably proved right because um i i made the comparison that being in london was just as dangerous as being in uh, in mumbai um which for a lot of english people they wouldn't necessarily think like that and i was proved right because we had attacks in london a few years later so you know unfortunately you know the 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 world had, was a different place and it wasn't just um it's not just india that's had uh difficulties uh, you know lots of places have um so i was i was very keen that we toured i wanted to tour india um we had the three test matches there and we played on three very good batting pitches so my regret is not making the most of those batting pitches particularly in bangalore i got to 50 and i i really would kick myself i should have i feel like i should have got on and got 100 which would have the reason i mention that because the the tour after uh, christmas in 2002 early 2002 to new zealand uh the pitches were a bit indifferent at times and um i think uh sometimes you need a little bit of luck here and there when you play on bowler friendly surfaces and i think if i'd got 100 at bangalore that would have given me a little bit of breathing space um but the tour didn't go well in in new zealand and um duncan fletcher met me after that tour and said look you know i think um you know i think that's that's probably it for you certainly under his um coaching era um so you know that that was disappointing and um but uh i think that subsequently to that you know i was still only 31 and um i i still was enjoying domestic cricket i still had a love of the game and um i still felt that you know i didn't take it for granted that i was a professional cricketer i still enjoyed it and um and so i threw myself into that really and um uh had some success with surrey um Uh, which sort of made up for the disappointments of uh, the international stage the final phase you did very well for surrey especially in the time between 2006 and 9 if i'm not mistaken and you almost came close to being brought back in, into the side for the 2009 ashes the oval test match if it was england in the 80s or the 90s you would definitely have made a comeback <laughs> yes. uh, because you were known to bring back older players in england in the 80s yes. and 90s there's a story of norman griffith coming to play lead england at a sharjah tournament at the age of 45 but england had moved on in 2009 you had a new age england and I remember a lot of debate between you and jonathan trot and stuff like that how close do you feel you were for a recall in the 2009 ashes uh, well i was definitely discussed uh, and i know that because i had a visit from jeff miller um preceding the match he i was playing for surrey against essex uh i think it was in colchester and uh, he came to the ground and had a chat with me um he 
he, he, you know, he, he said to me, oh, you know, the selectors felt that uh, they didn't want to select me because there would be so much pressure on me, you know. And I said, no, actually, Jeff, you're wrong. And you've made your decision already. But actually, this conversation should have happened before the selection meeting uh, to find out how I felt about it. Because my view was is that I had almost, I had given up on international cricket in when I was left out and after the conversation with Duncan Fletcher in 2002. So when you let go of something, you actually, if it comes back to you, you, you feel pretty relaxed about it. And that was definitely my attitude. There was a lot of speculation and media talk about me coming back into the side. And of course, it was against Australia at the Oval of where I had got 100 uh, in 2001. So I felt very relaxed about it and I would have been very happy to play. Having said that, uh, England made the right decision because Jonathan Trott performed brilliantly and then went on to have an excellent international career. So I think if I had been in charge of the England team, I would have, I would have made the same decision that they had made, in in looking to go in a different direction with a younger person. You think that, in my view, that was a turning point in English cricket, at least in my eyes, because English cricket in the past have gone for people who perform well in county cricket, irrespective of their age. Do you think that was a turning point in the way English cricket was managed, in your view? I think, personally, I feel the turning point had come earlier than that. Um, and it was probably more latterly to do with um, the Fletcher-Hussein partnership. And then when that passed on to Vaughan, I think the Vaughan captaincy benefited from the stability that Hussein and Fletcher uh, brought to England uh, latterly in sort of 2002, two, three. Um, but Vaughan took over and he was really good for the England players around him because... Michael, I thought, was an excellent captain, but also his attitude and persona was one of um, having a bit of humour, taking the pressure off in the environment. Um, he, 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 he got on well with the people around him. Um, he, was, he was quite matter-of-fact at times, but he also you know, didn't take himself too seriously. And I think that... Um, you know, he obviously had some very good players around him who came into the side and did extremely well. Shaskothic was established. Um, Strauss came in and, and uh, did very well uh, right from the word go. Top order batsmen, which, of course, you know, had always been a revolving door for England. Suddenly they had some, some rocks at the top of the order. Um, and, uh, and, of course, Kevin Peterson was um, around and Flintoff. So, you know, they had some really good cricketers that were around. And I think... Uh, Vaughan benefited from that and, and they managed to create, having the central contracts, much more emphasis from the team on the international summer, not worrying about their counties. Their focus was solely on the challenges that the international side would face. So, for example, if they were facing a team with predominantly spin bowlers, there would be a lot of preparation and discussion about how they were going to do well against that those challenges i mean that's what an elite international team should be doing when you finished your career playing career did you feel uh, satisfied with what you had done or uh, did you feel unfulfilled well i get asked this question a lot and um uh, i i always say that i can sleep at night because um given the circumstances i feel that i i gave it everything um, I think that's important for an individual. Um, it would be very unfortunate if someone was to feel bitter and have regrets. Uh, I, I don't have regrets in that I know I tried my best given the hand that I was dealt. And so, you know, I, I, as I said, I, I wouldn't change playing in the 90s for anything. I was proud to play in that era. I thought it was a magnificent era of test cricket. It was very tough. Um, but I know that I trained hard. I tried to talk to people, uh, listen to people, take advice. Um, and, you know, I had a lot of ups and downs, which really affected me. Um, but uh, uh, as I say, I know I, I gave it everything. And uh, uh, I, th I think to then go on and uh, to perform well at domestic level for another 10 years, um, to some degree, helped to make up for 
uh, the international cricket being so challenging. Now switching tracks. Uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a pr- chance for you to set the record straight. Your teammates, uh, especially Adam Holyoke and few others, have said that when you got out, uh, you were somebody that they would stay away from. Angus Fraser has written in detail about the fact that whenever you got out and he and you were coming back in, there was once a chance for him to go out, but he couldn't go out because you were very ang- you used to get very angry with yourself. There's a story of Adam Holyoke's helmet, uh, a dressing room shower, and a gym and. Uh, can you tell us something about that? No, I'm sure you would be having a laugh about it. What was that whole thing uh, about? Um, I think, well, it, it was it was uh, an intensity. I mean, it was born about, I suppose, um, by an intensity to want to do well, but also the the amount of uh, the amount that I wanted to do well, and perhaps I, I think that the the way that I, I didn't, I had a lot of expectation on me. I think from an early age, and um, at times that expectation would boil over, and I wouldn't handle it very well. And I didn't really have people around me who helped me deal with it very well. Uh, and by that I mean coaches, teammates, um, mentors. I didn't really have anyone around me. Uh, around that age of 19, 20, throughout my 20s, really, who helped me understand the bigger picture uh, to make me a a bit more emotionally intelligent, uh, to understand myself and understand, you know, when when you had difficult days, that that was all part of it, um, and that, you know, you had to retain a sort of a a fairly philosophical attitude. And so when when I look back, you know, I, you know, not happy with the way uh, I conducted myself, but I, I give myself a, a, a little bit of a leeway because, again, I think it was brought about by circumstances. Um, but yes, um, you're, I mean you're absolutely right. Uh, you know, I, I would, uh, you know, be striving to do well, and and often that would boil over. And, um, you know, some of my teammates, yes, they would certainly give me some space, uh, you know, if I got out to a bad shot or a bad decision. Um, and it was very unfortunate one occasion. I do remember the Adam Holyoke helmet where I came in. I think I may have been out in the 90s or something, but I, I came in and I um, was sort of banging things around in the dressing room. And I, I didn't realize, but I actually had, had whacked his helmet um, which had a bit of a dent in, and and so when it was his turn to go out to bat, he used to pick up his gloves and helmet, and as he walked out onto the field, that is the time when he would put the helmet on. Well, of course, he couldn't get it on properly um, because because it had a big dent in it, and I I I honestly got, I I didn't realise what had happened, um, but it had to have been me. So. Um, God, yeah, I was very apologetic uh, uh, to him, but um, yes, I, I, I don't. Uh, I, I, of course, I, I do feel great empathy with when I see young players who who do that now. I do feel great empathy, but also I feel like I can try to uh, to help them a little bit as well. And the shower in the dressing room and uh, the gym. Uh, Angus Fraser has written about it. That's why I'm asking you about it. Uh, well, of course, if Angus Fraser has written about it, it all must be true. I mean, but, yeah, he's, uh, don't forget, he was a journalist, so um, uh, he, may, he, he may have some artistic license in there. But uh, uh, I, 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 can't, I mean, I can't remember those particular uh, instances. I mean, one of the ways that um, I always think, uh, you know, and you see it quite a lot now, actually, is when players don't do well, that they can nip off to the gym because a lot of the players, uh, a lot of the grounds have gyms now. Uh, and so it would always be that if a batsman um, missed out, that they could go and work off a bit of steam and, and do a bit of fitness. And um, at least that would be constructive. Um, so uh, I'm sure that I was was probably doing that. But maybe one or two of the, the weights got bashed around a bit. I don't know. I can't remember. OK, uh, then there's this big moment when you won Strictly Come Dancing in 2006. What was all that about? Uh, were you a natural dancer always? Were you interested? How did you get into that and winning that trophy? How big a moment was that? Well, you know, 
funny enough, you know, it was a big moment in my life. Yeah, a very big moment in my life. And um, you can argue that it was, you, it, it was even bigger than, uh, you know, I'm not saying bigger than playing for England at cricket. It certainly wasn't as in my mind as big as that. But if you look in terms of the notoriety of the show and the popularity of the show, uh, Strictly Come Dancing in the UK is, has a big following. So our population is about 60 million and about 12 million people watch the final and you're beamed into people's front room prime time on a Saturday night. And so that that is a lot bigger um, publicity than it is playing cricket for England. Um, more, much more people watch Strictly Come Dancing than watch cricket for England. So it was it was a big deal here. And now, how did I get on the show? Bizarrely, uh, an agent rang me up and said, "Look, do you fancy going on this show?" I said, "No," <laughs> because uh, I'm an introvert. You know, it's not really it's not really me. And um, they said, oh, think about it. And uh, I knew I was coming up to retirement. So in the end, I said, OK, I'll give it a go. I know that Darren Goff had been on the previous year. Um, but he's a very, you know, he's an extrovert. He's a very different character to me. But um, um, I, in terms of I had I had no dance uh, experience or anything like that. I had played football when I was younger. I was reasonably light on my feet, but I had no idea about dancing and certainly not choreographed dancing. Um, and, um, but I was very lucky. I got paired with a lady who was, um, not only a former world champion dancer, but she also had done some coaching and she was very patient. And, um, uh, so we, we sort of developed a bit of a friendship and, um, uh, you know, I, I, I sort of, uh, enjoyed the training uh, the performance days were very nerve-wracking because it's live tv so if you fall over you know everybody sees um and i had to draw upon i think some of my cricket um cricket mentality really to to um to go out and um you know control the nerves and and try and um you know perform for 90 seconds uh, live in front of you know 12 million people so who is a better dancer, you or Darren Goff? I think it's Darren, actually. <laughs> Dar I mean, Darren's a big lad, um, big chest, big shoulders. Um, but uh, he's light on his feet, actually. And, um, you know, we after the shows, we in, in years after, we got asked to do charity performances and things like that. And um, I've seen him dance. He's still very, very good, actually. <laughs> so... Um, no, I'm uh, I'm uh, really happy with the experience. I mean, it was a fantastic life experience. It was something totally different that was in the entertainment world, completely outside of cricket. Um, so, as I say, I was very lucky with the partner that I had, and I, I, it was an, an amazing three months. It ended up being three months on the show, and um, you know, very fond memories of that to do something completely different. The final question: uh, Your experiences as a player. How has that helped you being the batting coach of England and now you're getting into the big world of franchise cricket as well? How has that experience helped you? Because you've been through the similar situations. Uh, so when you're dealing with young cricketers, young batsmen, does that help you in a big way? I think all coaches are uh, influenced hugely by their own experiences. And so, yes, um, I feel like my own experiences have greatly helped me the fact that um, I've been through so many ups and downs um, with international cricket um, I think you really I, I, I personally I really tried to get to know the individuals that I was coaching um, not not always gravitate to the ones that were doing well but actually give so much time to the ones that are struggling and are, and are not doing so well to try and build relationships there, trusting relationship um, that you can have honest communication with the, with the guys, um, and ultimately ask the right questions. Because I, I, you know, people said to me, "Oh, you're going to tell Alistair Cook," and I said, "No, I don't tell him anything, but I do ask him. I do ask him questions that hopefully provoke thought in the individual, and that they can come up with their own answers." And I think that at international level, that's the way you tend to coach. Um, and it's by creating good discussions. Often, you know, if I use Joe Root as an example, um, 
he was great because he used to like talk batting. Um, and sometimes, you know, the discussions between player and player are so powerful. And sometimes as a coach, if you can help engineer those conversations, then that's good coaching. So um, I, I'm really happy. I really enjoyed, I had five and a half years with the England setup, you know, England uh, under 19s, England Lions, the full side. Um, I really enjoyed it, working with the, uh, the best players. Um, but that was very much my coaching ethos, uh, was to try and provoke thought within the player that they come up with <clears throat> how they want to go out and play um, and, and how they want to go and play. Thanks a lot, Mark. It was lovely chatting with you. It was a great time chatting with you. Thanks a lot for this time. Thank you very much indeed. Take care and stay safe. You too.